Billy Boogie from Johnny Burnett and the Rock and Roll Trio, Andy Starr and Rockin' Rolling Stone, Sonny Fisher with Rockin' Daddy, and Eddie Bond slipping in. All rockabilly classics which today are as highly regarded as any of the classic rock and roll million sellers. I'm Mark Radcliffe, and welcome to When Rockabilly Ruled, OK? The story of the second coming of rock and roll, which turned out to be even bigger than the first. But this time, driven by records from the 1950s that had never had a UK release. We'll see how Rockabilly got to Britain in the late 1960s and went from the clubs to the pop mainstream in the mid-70s, gaining a key outlet on Radio 1. We hear from rediscovered Rockabilly artists who came to the UK, learn the story of jungle rock, plus the homegrown bands who became Rockabilly stars and a look at the music today. But first, a very loose definition. Rockabilly. A mix of country, hillbilly and rhythm and blues. With guitars, not always drums, but the absolute key ingredient, the upright slap bass. <laughs> Elvis, Scotty and Bill. Sun Records, Memphis, 1955 and Baby Let's Play House. Elvis's Sun Records are the rockabilly benchmark. And as he exploded across the American South, aspiring musicians ditched traditional country and got into the new sound. Well, if I had me a woman who was big and fair, I'd jump up and down like an alley cat. If I had me a woman, if I had me a woman, if I had me a woman, I wouldn't be roaming around. Matt Curtis, If I Had Me A Woman, recorded in 1956, never a hit, and not released here until 1974. So how did obscure American records, never initially released in Britain, kickstart a major musical trend in the UK two decades on? To answer that, we go to South Wales, where the UK's first rockabilly band was formed, Crazy Cavern and the Rhythm Rockers. <laughs> Cavan and the band had been introduced to Rockabilly thanks to local teddy boy, Breathless Dan Coffey, and his pioneering record-buying trips to the USA. Here's the band's founder, lead singer and songwriter, Cavan Grogan. Dan Coffey, then, who we met in Newport, was bringing back obscure Rockabilly records from America. Stuff that was never heard of over here, artists that was never heard of over here, etc. And we just started to pick up on some of this stuff because we just thought it was amazing, you know. When he came back, he was bringing back all these sort of Sun records and or other labels too, you know, and stuff we'd never heard of. And he was playing us this stuff and we just couldn't believe it. And we were buying these Sun records off in there for 10 shillings each. And so we became like one of the first bands in England to ever play any kind of rockabilly stuff. And he, I mean, back in those days, we was doing like Al Ferrier stuff in 1968 and things like that, Charlie Feather stuff and all that. Like, so when we first went to London, a lot of London kids had never heard some of these rockabilly records before. Plus, we was writing our own material, and they didn't know whether we'd wrote it or whether it was something obscure we'd come across or whatever. You know? There's the rhythm in your bones, and you know how I feel. But don't you cry me close, baby, just time is for real. Get ready for some rock and take them up and put them down. Give me one hand loose and I'll be satisfied. One Hand Loose from Charlie Feathers, whose 1956 recordings for King Records are today celebrated gems of rockabilly. They were amongst the many singles brought back from the USA by Dan Coffey to be snapped up by Cavan and a growing number of UK rockabilly fans. Cavan's lead guitarist, Lyndon Meads. 
Soon as I heard the Carl Perkins dance album, I forgot about Gang Marvin and the Shadows because I just thought, oh wow, I mean, I never heard anything like this before. I just had to play that music. Used to go up the Breathless Dance. And then when I was listening to some of the rockabilly sun stuff and everything like that, I just, oh, just great. And that was my really, like, sort of big influence of listening to those records. But I couldn't really, like, grasp the licks and everything that well. I knew the sound and everything, so I just used to make up my own thing. Well, you know, I play it my style in this whatever. So I kind of involved, like, sort of doing my own sort of thing, just the picking, like the Scotty Moore and James Burton. I just wanted to play like that. Rock and roll promoter and agent Paul Barrett was a key figure in the South Wales connection. He managed Cavan and also the early career of Shaking Stevens. Cavan was out and out Ted and been a huge fan of Sun Records, Jerry Lee Lewis. He was the first man who actually went to the States, bought these records, bought Sun Records, picked them up for pennies in the warehouse. And uh, I remember him telling me that when he went there, they were walking over the 78 records. All that music becoming available, which was brand new to everybody. I'd never heard of Ray Campy in the 70s, I never heard of Matt Curtis, it was only until the 70s I heard of these guys and heard their records for the first time. All the time that rockabilly thing was just going, the, the Sun Records were coming initially through Danny, then other people were importing them and the whole thing was gradually building. Rolling Rock started in America, and that guy Ronnie Wise in his back room with a tape recorder and he found a few old rockabilly heroes and he recorded these records that were coming out. And the whole thing just started picking up. And with Shaking Steams and the Sunsets, we uh, graduated to then the very lucrative college circuit. No one's ever looked at the Welsh connection, you see, because you've got Danny Coffey bought on the records, you've got the backbeats with Shaky, you've got Crazy Cavern, and you've got Edmonds. I mean, that's all in South Wales, all in that sort of immediate little South Wales area. Crazy Cavan and the Rhythm Rockers, and another of Cavan's songs, Rockabilly Star, recorded in Holland in 1975. Their wild stage act and original songs, released on their own label, Crazy Rhythm, built a huge following. Cavan and Lyndon again. For myself, I was always interested in the writing side of it. As much as I loved doing the great songs like Blue Suede Shoes, etc., and all the songs, like, I always wanted to write my own songs, and especially for the Teddy Boy scene, because I used to think, well, the Teddy Boy culture is something that I loved. And I thought there isn't any songs about the Teddy Boys and Teddy Girls, there just isn't any. And I really wanted to write songs about the Teddy Boys, you know? The first record that we did, we approached record companies who took no interest whatsoever, you know? And we were writing our own material, so we was getting annoyed about this. We thought, well, we've wrote all these songs and stuff, and we can't seem to capture any interest from any record companies or nothing. So we all talked, and we thought, well, we've got to find out how we can do this ourselves. We used to rehearse a lot, and we always used to have this tape recorder in Cavan's front room. We are trying to get on to a record label, and I was sending tapes. Nobody was interested. So in the end, I went up to London, to Denmark Street, a back street place, and took the tape got an acetate done up and then we went to a company called SRT and they were the only ones who pressed it up we got a thousand copies pressed up that was Teddy Boy Boogie and Bob Little Baby the role of Cavan and his band in spreading rockabilly across the UK can't be overstated broadcaster and program researcher Jeff Barker was DJing at that time and often gigged with them as a band Cavan really are a British institution the only thing is no one outside the rock and roll scene knows that and the whole thing would not have happened in the way it did without them. 
Their gigs were, and still are to this day, a total riot. The interaction they have with their fans is incredible. Uh, plus, of course, they write their own songs, singing about the subjects that the Teds and Rockabillies can all relate to. There really is no one like Crazy Cavern. Boz Bora, who today plays guitar with Morrissey, was a member of hit band The Polecats in the early 80s. He recalls the impression Cavern made on him. I think late 77 we started going to punk gigs, which was probably just after we started going to rockabilly gigs. I think the first one I went to was Crazy Cavern at the Orange Tree in Fire and Barnet. And I was astounded by it. It was just so loud with this slap back echo on the vocal and right in your face, very sort of aggressive, but such a tough sound. I'd always thought really that rockabilly was more like the punk of rock and roll. I really like the primitive rockabilly that's sort of out of tune, badly recorded, hit vocal before it was finally tuned for the pop market. Well, I went to my baby, I all been the knee, so baby, 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 will you marry me? She said, sorry, daddy, but what can I say? I found a new love just the other day, and you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> well, you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> yes, you're barking up the wrong tree. That's what she said to me. Well, I pleaded and the bag nearly out of my mind. The baby, baby, baby girls are hard to find. She just says, sorry, daddy, I try to understand. I'm going with the cutest guy in the land. And you're barking up the wrong tree. Well, you're barking up the wrong tree. Yes, you're barking up the wrong tree. That's what she said to me. His broadcaster, record producer and writer, Stuart Coleman. The 70s was a very funny time. We had the punk era going, we'd just come out of glam rock. And I think audiences in general were looking for something a little bit more earthy. And when the punk thing came along with all its propulsion and the, the energy factor, the next best thing to that was the rock and roll vibe left over from the 50s. And if you want a tangent, you've got to look in the direction of the Sex Pistols and Malcolm McLaren. Now, Malcolm McLaren, at the time he started managing the Sex Pistols, would walk around town with a teddy boy suit on, which would be a velvet collar, a draped jacket, and a string tie in the Western sense. So you couldn't really say, this guy's a punk guy, but he's a rockabilly looking kind of guy, you know. But the two weren't that far apart. Jeff Barker again. By that time, of course, there was so much stuff coming out that we never had before, but the ones that really started it all were the Sun Rockabilly collections. Uh, Sun Rockabillies were just unbelievable. We'd never heard or seen any of these tracks released in Britain before. And it was titled after the great lost hit that Carl Perkins never had that he recorded for Sun, Put Your Cat Clothes On. They took my blue way shoe down to Omo Got to rockin' with a rhythm right on over the hill The undisputed king of rockabilly, Carl Perkins, and Put Your Cat Clothes On, recorded at Sun in late 1956. Incredibly, it lay unreleased for 20 years, and Carl had to relearn it when he toured here in 1978. Billy Lee Riley made some of Sun's greatest ever recordings, but they, and he, never got the worldwide recognition they so clearly deserved at the time. <laughs> And it started to roll. I saw 
Billy Lee Riley and his little green men, as it said on the label, and Flying Saucers Rock and Roll. Issued in 1957, and another track that became a rockabilly standard after its UK release in the early 70s. That song inspired the formation of British rockabilly band Flying Saucers. Here's bass player Pete Pritchard. We started playing Flying Saucers, uh, the, the song by Billy Lee Riley, and the crowd just said, that's great, you should call yourselves Flying Saucers. And we thought, well, yeah, that's a pretty good name. So that's how it all started, really. It became our theme song, and of course the name really lent itself to, to you know, all sorts of things. We ended up with the album, The Planet of the Drapes, and, and it was just a load of scope, you know, to do things with that name. During the early part of the 70s, the new sound of rockabilly was taking over the UK rock and roll scene. The Wild Wax Show was three London Teddy Boy DJs, Jailhouse John, Runaround Stu and Rockin' Roy. They would be directly responsible for the UK's biggest rockabilly hit, Jungle Rock. Here's Rockin' Roy Williams. Well, my brother-in-law heard this DJ in South End in a club down there playing this record and he came back and he said, I've just heard one of the best records I've ever heard in my life, where are we going to get it? So we went round to see this guy Tony Martin and he said, oh, you mean this one? And he picked up this LP and it was called Rare Rockabilly or something like Volume, whatever. And the label had Jungle Rock. The whole LP was selling on the strength of this one track. And we put it on and I just went, wow. <laughs> it was unbelievable. But what they'd actually done, the, the Dutch guy who put out this dodgy al album, had taken the original 45 and speeded it up. It really brought the record to life. And when we used to play down the Lyceum, we'd have to play it about five times in a night. People would run from the balcony to get on the dance floor and go mad for it. I was walking through the jungle just the other night. Oh, well, I heard a make a rumble and I thought it was a fight. Oh, well, I started to listen and begin to move my feet. It was a jungle, a whole jungle, doing a knock a beat. It was a jungle, 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 jungle rock. 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 A knock a beat and I had to move my feet. It was a jungle, 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 jungle rock. People were starting to laugh at us. They just couldn't believe, you know, that this could happen because the radio and the media in general is always misconstrued what our scene is about. They've seen us as sort of Elvis come golden oldies, happy days. It wasn't that at all. It never has been, really. And we eventually persuaded somebody at Charlie Records to put it out, which is a new young company starting up in the Sun catalogue. And they managed to find the master tape. They did a brilliant job. We went to the, the mastering room when the record was cut and said, look, speed up the master, but not quite as much as the album. And they got it just perfectly. And then just went number two in the charts. And it was number one in Germany. Jungle Rock, recorded in 1956 by the completely obscure Hank Mizell, was a massive hit in 1976, with over three months on the UK charts. So plans were made firstly to find him, and then bring him to the UK. Shelby Singleton was the man who'd bought Sun Records from Sam Phillips. He signed Hank Mizell to his Nashville-based Sun Entertainment Corporation. Well, we got a call that Jungle Rock was making all kinds of noise, mostly in clubs, People were going nuts wanting to buy the record, and they didn't know who it was, where it was from, and everything. So we chased it down and found that it was recorded in a garage up in Michigan someplace. And we found Hank Mizell down in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. He was working as a shipping clerk in a warehouse. They were doing promotion, and of course the record became a huge hit in uh, England. And it was not only a hit just in England, but it was all over Europe it was a hit. But it wasn't all old 50s tracks. Californian Ronnie Weiser had started his Rolling Rock label in 1973, and as it said on every single, authentic American rockabilly, recorded in Ronnie's living room, the sound of America's youth. Well, ever since you've been gone, I've been crying, oh, I know. It was you, not me, that left. They're on all for somebody else. Oh, I'm over you, but I just can't find a way.
Roy Williams again. He was doing new young acts mixed with sort of 50s acts. So he'd find 50s acts and use them sometimes to sing, sometimes to play the instruments, and then have other guys singing with them. And what was really fascinating about it was that it had the sound, the spirit, and the feel of rockabilly, but the moment you heard it, you knew it wasn't 50s. It was different. It had its own house sound, for want of a better term. Fifties rockabilly Ray Campy with Toro, one of his rolling rock singles that were all big hits on the European rock and roll scene. A Toro! By September 1976, Stu Coleman and Jeff Barker were on BBC Radio 1 with It's Rock and Roll. Shaking Stevens providing the theme tune. We ain't got pop, we ain't got soul. What we got? It's rock and roll! Needle time with the BBC, eight minutes of every hour had to be accomplished with live music. And they thought, well, that's our well, sticking point. And we said, well, no, you've got Shaking Stevens, you've got Crazy Cavern, you've got the Flying Saucers, you've got Red Hot, you've got Red Hot and Blue and all these different acts who can quite happily give us 20 minutes of live music. And we proved that by bringing the bands in and recording them. And that became one of the features of the show. And that even expanded, once the show got on the air, to bring in American acts who otherwise wouldn't have got a voice here. For instance, we had uh, great people like James Booker and Piano Red and Professor Longhair, who were so cool to our show that the John Peel program wanted copies at the time so they could run them in that slot too. One of the first bands in session were Crazy Cavern and the Rhythm Rockers. Hey, Mr. T, look, don't get cheap. Why don't I be a chatty boy suit? Why don't you check out with the bell of a car? Back with faster and my kid will be out of the wild. It's a day to time. Hey, why don't you take your time? Hey, why don't you take your time? Hey, why don't you take your time? Why don't you take your time? Why don't you take your time? Well, I got a deal, it's just in the teeth. Why don't you take your time in my old blue jeans? Keep the steel and I'll get this wild. Why don't you take your time? 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 What we noticed about the scene outside then, at the rock and roll gigs, we was having like the Ted audience, but at some of the other places we was playing, places like the Hope and Anchor, Nashville Rooms and stuff like that, we started to notice these young kids coming in, which became the punks. We thought, well, these are strange characters. They, they, they're wearing treats of them, but they, you know, the rest of them don't look very tame, you know. <laughs> and suddenly we found out that there was a lot of punks coming to these gigs that wouldn't come to the other gigs. And so the, all those things started was filtering into the music scene. And the rock and roll scene then seemed to flip from... A lot of the Teds were starting to turn against us because they said that we brought too much rockabilly into the scene. And it was getting really weird. And I just used to think, well, to me, like, rockabilly is rock and roll. It's all the same to me. Crazy Cavern and the Rhythm Rockers recorded for It's Rock and Roll in October 1976. And one of Cavern's best-known songs, Wildest Cat in Town, which is still in their set today. You're listening to When Rockabilly Ruled OK on BBC Radio 2. The Radio 1 show was ideally placed to promote the arrival of the Rolling Rock Tour in 1977. It starred Matt Curtis and Ray Campy, and they were welcomed to the UK as conquering heroes. Here is Matt Curtis. The first thing that really grabbed me was 
meeting the Ted at the airport. They were waiting for Ray and the band and I to get off the plane, and we did. I guess the next thing that hit me right in the face was coming on stage at the royalty night spot, and nothing but screaming, and those Matt Curtis haircuts, they called them, you know, the flat top with the, with the sidewalls, and they was... I mean, I was just stunned. I, I didn't know whether to say anything or do anything. And, it, and then when I went into the, the first song, they was mouthing it along and singing at the same time. And that really almost freaked me out. I couldn't imagine that these people knew what I was doing. Matt Curtis and Ducktail, released on Rolling Rock at the time of his first UK tour. Jeff Barker. The British audience reactions to that Rolling Rock tour were simply staggering. I mean, after all, there's Matt Curtis and Ray Campy, original rockabilly heroes, on stage in Britain. No one would ever have believed that just a few years beforehand. I remember Ray Campy brought over a couple of young guys from his American rockabilly rebels band, Jerry Sikorsky and Colin Winsky, and they were augmented over here by Tom Riley, who was the drummer with Memphis Bend, and Stu. Stu Coleman was playing bass. So it was a really good band. <laughs> Biggest song on the rock and roll circuit, Rockin' at the Ritz. The Rolling Rock Tour of 77 paved the way for the UK tours of a staggering list of American rockabilly artists. Charlie Feathers, Billy Lee Riley, Warren Smith, Gene Summers, Eddie Bond, Carl Mann, Hayden Thompson, Dale Hawkins and more all toured and many became regulars, playing the annual Hemsby Weekenders. One of the most popular was Sonny Burgess. Ronnie Hawkins would hold there, and he said, it's like a time tunnel. He said, you know, it's like you've gone back in time. But it was really fun. Best fans in the world, let's face it.
still a UK visitor, the Arkansas rockabilly wild man Sonny Burgess, and We Wanna Boogie, one of his many great recordings for Sun Records. The rockabilly slap bass was a big change for UK rock and roll bands who'd always used electric bass guitar. Pete Pritchard was bass player with the Flying Saucers. At that time we just had no idea, no concept of rockabilly slap bass. It's something that the whole art of it really had died out at that time and we were listening to these records and we just assumed that it was a drum making this percussive sound and the drummer would try and replicate this sound by playing on the rim of the drum or a wooden block even. That sort of worked, but it was still an electric sound, so in the end, we, the only thing we could think of doing as we became more aware of this was we tried putting a, a bass guitar pickup on the double bass, but that meant we had to use steel strings, and so you really lost the authentic sort of sound of the double bass. We managed to amplify it, at least to some extent. All of a sudden, the sort of penny started to drop, you know, the crowd loved it, and we realised that really this was the way forward. And of course, as time went on, we managed to get the sound better and the technology got better so we could get the sound and of course other guys came along who developed the slapping technique and, and I guess we all learnt from each other and then all of a sudden it all became clear and we were romping away with it. The wooden block was attached to the bass drum and then I'd try to imitate the sound of the bass on the wooden block so that was the nearest we could get to that type of sound and uh, as Pete said it did work and even that formed quite an exciting sound but obviously nowhere near as good as what the upright did once that started being played. With the Bill Haley and the Comet sound the slap bass was such a prominent thing on it that great dance rhythm the whole feel of that upright and that offbeat on the snare with the echo was the greatest sort of thing to dance to and it's all due to that slap bass and, and the sound of the snare drum. Pete Pritchard on bass and Terry Earl drums, both formerly of Flying Saucers. Ray Campy's influence would also play a big part in Matchbox, becoming the first UK rockabilly band to make the crossover and have a chart hit. Their lead guitarist and songwriter then, and now, is Steve Bloomfield, and he wrote their breakthrough UK hit, Rockabilly Rebel. The most important people to come along to influence us, apart from Cavan, of course, was Ray Campy. When Ray Campy came along and played at K-Star, he had the upright bass, white, with a rebel flag painted on the back, and he'd be kind of jumping all over it and stuff, and we thought, that's great, that's, that's definitely the way forward. Ray Camp is rocking at the Ritz. It sounded like a mandolin. It was actually a violin, I think, but it sounded all right on the mandolin. And we wanted to bring something different to the stage. So we started using the mandolin on Setting the Woods on Fire when we recorded that album at the end of 77. <laughs> That's when we first noticed this kind of new breed, which were like, you got the Teds and you got the bikers, but then you were getting like the, they were wearing sort of like the sports jackets and the way Elvis looked in around about 56. Some of them had the Hawaiian shirts and the flat top hairdos and stuff, so they were calling themselves Rockabilly Rebels because they were a lot younger. 
a little bit different from the Teds and the bikers. And that's why I wrote Rockabilly Rebel. <laughs> Matchbox also backed Matt Curtis on a session for It's Rock and Roll, and this has never been aired in nearly 20 years. Your eyes say you're the devil, your lips say you're the saint. Sometimes I think I got you know, but then the whole time I know I ain't a hoop, but the baby you get mad. Who's the fuck? Who's the fuck? Who's the fuck? Who's the fuck? Are you thrilled? Why she be up like that? You know I love you, baby. The kind of thing you love me too. When we kiss, it drives me crazy. Can't nobody kiss like you. Oh, my baby, you give me goosebumps. I can feel you, baby. Goosebumps. When you kiss me, baby. Goosebumps. When you kiss, I ain't never had nobody. She be up like that. Matt Curtis. Gosh, I did a bunch of shows then. They backed me on just about every tour for the first uh, few years coming over there. They were just great guys. They were going to become a huge act worldwide for a while. There's something about you, baby, I ain't never seen before. I don't know what it is. He gets me more than ever. He gets me more. Ooh, well, baby, you get me. Who's the boss? How you doing, baby? Who's the boss? When you chew me, baby. Who's the boss? When you kiss, I ain't never had nobody shake me up like this. Who's the boss? When you chew me, baby. Who's the boss? How you doing, baby? Who's the boss? When you chew me, baby. Matt Curtis with Matchbox in session for Radio 1 and Goosebumps, one of the songs Matt first recorded in 1956. Next to make the jump from the rock and roll clubs to top of the pops was the guy who had become the biggest selling singles artist of the 1980s, Shaking Stevens. My baby works in a hot dog stand, making them hot dogs as fast as you can. Up steps a cat and I'm done, you slow, get me too hot. My first chart hit was Hot Dog, and I got to 34, I think, and then I had a, another song called, I think it was Hey May, which didn't actually reach the top 40, and then I had uh, Marie Marie, which got in the 20, and then I did another song, original song called Shooting Gallery, which didn't get in the top 40, and then came This Old House, You Drive Me Crazy, and so forth, yeah. Well, I think the time was right, I mean, Hank Marvin, that is, he said uh, it was the perfect record at that time, it was new, it was fresh, and people needed that kind of style of music, and I guess he was right. Shaking Stevens and an It's Rock and Roll session take of his first chart hit in 1980, Hot Dog. Stuart Coleman played bass in the band and produced Shaky too. He'd opened up a whole new thing for an era that kicked off with Matchbox, The Darts, Chaz and Dave, and eventually, fortunately for me, uh, which allowed me to start producing records at Shaking Stevens. And Radio 1 was then primed to play what would otherwise have been considered specialist show material in prime time. So your general public was suddenly quite happy to hear a Shaky or a Matchbox 
right alongside the current Super Tramp or Nick Lowe or Elvis Costello release that was out as a pop record at the time. So we really felt we'd achieved something. The Jets were a tight rockabilly outfit from the Midlands. Three good-looking young guys who, in 1981, were in the charts and on many a teenage girl's bedroom wall. They were the Cotton Brothers, Ray, Tony and slap bass playing vocalist, Bob. Between 81 and about 84, we was in and out the charts with various songs. I would have been about 22 and Ray would have been about 19. Tony would have been 15 when we went out to tour supporting Shake and Stevens. And after that, whilst we were sort of on that tour, really, we had our first top 20 with Yes Tonight, Josephine. We had a quite a big fan club called the Jet Set and, you know, they used to get a membership card. And, you know, when I used to come to the gigs, they used to wave Saturday type scarves with their mug shots of us, three of us on there, you know, and the Jets logo and all this type of thing. But, yeah, we had a, quite a big fan club. With the dynamite. Yes, tonight, Josephine, yes, tonight. Everything, Josephine, will be alright. Well, I'm gonna give my heart to you, don't ask me. Well, let me get to know it's true tonight, Josephine, yes, tonight. I had love from the start. I should try. Yes, tonight, Josephine. Yes, tonight. Everything, Josephine will be alright. Well, I'm gonna give my heart to you. Don't ask me, but you know I do tonight. Josephine, yes, tonight. Yes, tonight. Yes, tonight. At the time, I mean, I remember appearing on television four times in one day. In those days, the early 80s, we did about 70 major English television shows, as well as shows all around Europe. The kids that were coming to watch us and buy out our stuff were young teenagers, really. Everyone suddenly jumped on the bandwagon in the early 80s and called everything rockabilly. And then all of a sudden, double basses started appearing here, there and everywhere, and everything had to have the word rockabilly in it, because it was the trendy thing for probably about a year. It'll probably come back and be trendy again, who knows? <laughs> Yes, tonight, Josephine, yes, tonight. Still gigging today, the Jets and Yes Tonight Josephine, one of a string of hits they enjoyed in the early 80s. By then, Rockabilly was part of the pop mainstream, and the thousands of kids in their fan club, the Jet Set, probably had no idea who Charlie Feathers was. Also in 1981, another young band appeared, the Polecats. Boz Bora, who today plays with Morrissey, was their guitarist. We did a three-week tour with Rockpile in 1980. They put us in a demo studio for FB Records, Nick Lowe's studio. EMI put us in their studio for some demoing. So there was a bit of interest. People come to see us, producers come to see us. I remember Visconti came and saw us at the venue. Phonogram came out with the best deal. We signed it, I think, Christmas 1980. I think I just finished doing my paper round. Early 1981, we went in the studio with Dave Evans, who we'd been on tour with for three weeks. Their first hit came in 81, with the rockabilly workout of a David Bowie song. I remember the first time it was mentioned, Phil Bloomberg said at the Rock Garden one night, I think we should do a cover of John Mayer Dancing. And I don't quite know how it came about, but we did. And I
A lot of people, there's a lot, especially a lot of American rockabillies that are younger than me, said you know, the first thing. Their musical heritage. Robert Gordon came from the New York punk scene, and his arrival in the UK with guitar legend Link Ray caused a big stir. My gal is red hot, your gal ain't doodly squat, yeah! <laughs> Jeff Barker. Oh, Robert Gordon and Link Ray's gig at the Charing Cross Astoria, it was February 1978. It was just unbelievable. And Link Ray has to have been the loudest guitarist on the planet that there ever, ever was. <laughs> And then after them, of course, came the Stray Cats. And there was a little bit of resentment, jealousy, I don't know, call it what you will, amongst some of the British rock and roll fans and the musicians, the fact that the first really big worldwide rockabilly band was an American band. We'd never really been part of the British scene and all that stuff that was happening in the 70s. But then, of course, it was their music to start with. Stray Cats and Runaway Boys, their first hit from 1980. By the mid-80s, Rockabilly had returned to the clubs, pubs and weekenders. But its years in the mainstream meant that it was no longer just on the fringe of rock and roll. And 30 years on, a new generation fly the UK flag. One of the finest guitarists anywhere, Daryl Hyatt. Well, I was in Green Bay a couple of years back in Wisconsin where they do the big rocking 50s fest thing. They get together just about everybody that's still alive from the 50s that can hop on stage and sing and play this music. But you also get to see all the modern current bands that are playing and it's a great opportunity to go over and see American artists like Deep Dickerson and Big Sandy and Marty Brom and people like that and hear them because they're such great artists. But this particular Green Bay, Slim Jim was hosting a jam session. So every evening, you know, we'd go over after we'd finished doing what we're doing and just sit there and have a couple of beers and watch him on stage. And then one day I thought, well, you know, I'd love to get up and say I'd work with him or met him. So I got up and did a couple of Cochrane numbers and he came up afterwards and said, I've got a tour of Europe, would you be interested in doing it with me? And it was unbelievable, just out of the blue like that. And 
we recorded an album together in LA with Gilby Clark, Guns N' Roses was producing it and the whole idea is to do the 50s thing but sort of modernise it, bring it up to date. Daryl Hyam and Down the Line from a CD issued in 2006. Daryl has been the foremost name on the UK rockabilly scene for over 10 years and today runs his own label and studio and produces many UK rockabilly bands. I've always been very, very passionate about the music. I want it to survive. It's terribly important to me, not just because it's what I do for a living, but it's just I love the music and I want to see it last and I want to see it grow and evolve and turn into something that's going to be around for another 50 years, you know, and the only way to do that is to encourage new bands out there that are trying to play the music and trying to do their thing, put their own stamp on it, and we need to nurture and encourage bands like that. And I think over the next couple of years or so, we're going to see a lot more younger bands coming into this music and try to do something with it, and I want to be there to help and encourage them. The UK rockabilly scene is alive and well in 2007. Alan Wilson, a former member of the Sharks in the 80s, has his own label and studio and produced the current biggest selling band on the circuit, Jack Rabbit Slim. In my opinion, Rockabilly still stacks up on a business level. It's a huge worldwide thing. There are uh, labels, there are bands, there are hunters, you know, customers, still all over the world. There are some very big festivals going on, you know, the Viva Las Vegas Festival, for example, is huge. Hemsby in Great Britain, another huge rock and roll festival. One of the hottest bands of the last couple of years are a band called Jack Rabbit Slim, and thankfully they're on my label. Being a cult thing, word of mouth, internet, kind of personal recommendation, that type of thing, really, really plays into it. So, for example, a band like Jack Rabbit Slim, who can sell a thousand CDs in the first month with minimal airplay, you can bet your life they're going to be pretty good. I think the reason that Rockabilly perhaps has lasted so long is that we're not talking about computer-generated samples and loops and funny noises. We're talking about real songs. We're talking about real singers, real musicians, real performances. And I don't think there's really ever any substitute for a real person singing a real song. UK band Jack Rabbit Slim and their own song Geez Louise from the album Sleazabilly. So could it all happen again? Stuart Coleman. Here we are 30 years on from that era and the, and the feeling to my mind is no different. Boy, does the business need a kick up the butt from the elements of rock and roll. Nothing will top that. And it doesn't need to go to university. It doesn't need to be schooled. It doesn't need to be refined. The rawness of it will always attract newcomers. Lyndon Needs. Well, we are cult. I mean, that's what it's down to now. But it is just amazing because, I mean, most of the audience are always much younger than us. I think it's just great to still get appreciated after all these years. I, I never thought from 1970 when we began, and we're still doing it, and popular as ever. It's just great. Roy Williams and his record label are still looking to the future. As a record label, I must say I'm very excited about a new band I found from the Liverpool area. The eldest one's 18. The band is called Furious, and essentially they're two brothers and a girl bass player and a, a mental drummer. <laughs> The 
people I feel sorry for, if you like, are the acts, who get no recognition from the media whatsoever. You know, it would be nice for them to have some recognition. I've had bands that have come and gone on my label that have sold more records and been more talented than some records that are in the charts, and they get virtually zero out of it. And I feel bad about that. Isn't it? Contemporary rockabilly furious with the Asbo Shuffle. And finally, Jeff Barker. There's some fantastic bands like Jack Rabbit Slim, the King Cats, Rudy LaCrue and the All Stars, Paul Ansel, who regularly plays with Scotty Moore's recorded at Sun with him. And in America you got Big Sandy and Marty Brom. And in Europe, Sue Marino. And Marco DiMaggio has to be the best kept guitar secret on the planet. And still gigging with the original lineup, Matchbox, the Jets. And of course, Cavern, bless them, they're just going to go on forever. But the thing is, it's all gone back to being underground now, exactly as it was back in the early 70s. This program is the first time that much of this music has been aired on national radio in 30 years, and some of these new bands have never been heard. The standard of musicianship on the British rockabilly scene in 2007 has never been better. I'm a rockabilly rebel, I'm here to when Rockabilly Ruled, OK, was written and produced by Jeff Barker and is dedicated to the memory of Sunglasses Ron Staples, the king of the London Tets. Oh,